Europe Out Loud, a podcast about Europe's history, culture, and civilization. Brought to you by the Martin Center with Federico Reo. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fifth episode, the fifth episode of our podcast series, Europe Out Loud. My name is Federico Taviorio. I'm the host of this podcast series on Europe's culture, history, and civilization. And I am very pleased about the topic we are discussing today, Christian politics and Christian democracy, what's left. It's a provocative title, as uh, always. We, we try to choose provocative titles. Uh, this time, it's not only, I have to say, a provocation for others, but also a provocation for ourselves. So it's a double provocation. Um, because we are, in a way, uh, coming from this tradition, the tradition of Christian democracy. So asking what's left is a way to, in a way, question the, the relevance of this tradition for current debates. But also it's a challenge, I think, to all those who have been saying for the last two or three centuries, actually, that uh, Christian politics was dead, that it was over, that it, that it had no future, that it was backward, that it was a thing of the past. And when we uh, look closely at it, we may discover that um, there is more left than we uh, think, and that this, uh, uh, what is left is more relevant than we uh, may have thought. This is a bit of a special episode because I am not alone on the record. I am extremely pleased to welcome Professor Rick Torfs, uh, who has a long and distinguished ca career. He was the is still a professor of canon law at the Catholic University of Leuven, but he was the rector of the Catholic University of Leuven and the dean of the Faculty of Canon Law. He was a senator of the CDMV, the Flemish Christian Democratic Party, uh, which is a member of the European People's Party, and uh, uh, we should stress also the party of our founder, Wilfred Martens, mm -hmm. uh, whom uh, you knew well. I knew him very well, of course. And uh, you have been active on a variety of topics, including religious liberty, the protection of religious minorities. You comment extensively on issues regarding the Catholic Church and beyond. Um, and you are a columnist for several Belgian and Dutch uh, newspapers. A very warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in this beautiful setting. So our idea was to uh, have a conversation through some of the things that we deem meaningful on the topic. We cannot cover all the issues. We will try mm -hmm. to cover um, issues that have to do, first of all, with the identity of Christian democracy, what it is about, uh, but also with the future of Christian democracy and the, the enduring relevance, if any, of Christian democracy and Christian politics. And I will start with a very basic uh, question, and that's uh, uh, the difference between Christian politics and Christian democratic politics, which may sound like a cryptic question, but my, my way of thinking about it is that the West has been imbued with Christian politics for a very long time, since the conversion of Constantine, I like to say, in the fourth yeah. century. Uh, but Christian democracy is a relatively uh, recent. Sure, idea. you have, of course, uh, various ways of uh, uh, Christian politics. Uh, it can be the defense of Christianity against uh, other religions, uh, for instance, the Reconquista in Spain, mm. in order to, um, let's say, um, surrender or, or to recover the territory again. But also internally, there have been uh, many splits and fights uh, against uh, between Catholics and Protestants, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, you have had also the, uh, the discussions between um, Christians and certain forces of enlightenment, the French Revolution, etc. So we have had many moments uh, of, of, of discussion where indeed Christian politics was uh, were involved. On the other hand, uh, Christian democratic uh, politics, that's a rather new notion. Um, um, especially after World War II, I think it became truly uh, important, also innovative. It was one of the steering forces for a new Europe with uh, human rights, but also with a welfare state, influenced by personalists, uh, including uh, Jacques Maritain, Emmanuel Mounier, and others. And then, indeed, the idea was a little bit, well, let's try to find a, a good solution between wild capitalism, not nice, poor people will be the victims of it, and on the other hand, socialism, 
uh, also uh, moderately sympathetic only uh, with a lot of victims uh, in communist countries. Uh, I also think that uh, not only the ideas were strong, but also the circumstances were good for Christian Democrats. There was a fear for communism, and there was, on the other hand, uh, too much interest also for emancipation of people uh, to opt immediately for the other system for mm. wild capitalism. And then, of course, those Christian roots with the sometimes ambiguous character of Christianity, the nice ambiguous character, the paradox, uh, solidarity, but also at the same time personal responsibility. Thanks a lot. And there is a profound truth in what you say in the sense that the notion of a third way between mm -hmm. several things of a balance mm -hmm. has been central to Christian democratic thinking and to some extent uh, Christian thinking. And this brings me to a second issue. Uh, Christian Democrats have traditionally positioned themselves in the political spectrum at the center or the center right. It depends a bit on the country. And this was a way to stress precisely what you said, the difference mm -hmm. both from the left, that is the socialist and to some extent the liberals, and the, the, the far right, uh, that is the fascist in the 20th century, all yeah. forces that played an important role. There is a, a more problematic relationship, which is often neglected, and it's the relationship between Christian democracy and conservatism. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's on the one hand, uh, in the early fights of Christian democracy, many conservative elements yeah. against the secularization brought about by the yeah. French Revolution and the Enlightenment were contained. Uh, and certainly in some of the issues that we, uh, the societal issues that we are discussing, many Christian Democrats are on the conservative side, but at the same time, that many of them have disliked historically the label conservative. How do you explain that? Um, well, it's maybe a lack of uh, self-confidence sometimes, and uh, uh, the importance paid to the label sometimes more than to the underlying reality. There are two elements. First of all, you mentioned the idea of uh, being in the center of politics. I'm very much in favor of that, not the right, not the left. Only it shouldn't be an aim on its own. If you say, I absolutely want to be in the center, then you have no other idea, no proper ideas. Then you are following what others do, and then you try to be in the middle. If everybody goes to the left, you also go to the left. If everybody goes to the right, you do the same. Uh, so that's uh, just a lack of ideas. So normally speaking, indeed, the Christian Democrat will end up in the center, but there can be moments that uh, you are uh, elsewhere. For instance, in a communist regime, you can't be in the center. In a fascist regime, you can't be in the center. So that's the first thing. Then when it comes to conservatism, there I would say um, conservatism, um, although it's more popular now than it used to be the uh, past decades, um, means that you want to conserve something. But what specifically? Uh, to me, it's sometimes unclear. Some people want to conserve things that never existed previously. I'm more in favor of another notion, which is uh, tradition. And that's different, because mm. uh, tradition is much more living and lively than conservatism is. It's a better notion, I think. And it also creates another type of solidarity. So uh, we often talk about uh, solidarity in this world, tradition is a kind of vertical solidarity following the timeline, also uh, respecting those who lived before us, who passed away. I should here quote Edmund Burke, not in defense of conservative, but, mm -hmm. but to say that there is uh, a convergence of some sort between the two movements at times. Uh, uh, he famously said that society is a contract between the dead the living mm -hmm. and those who are yet to be born, yeah. which is pretty much what you are saying about tradition yeah. and, and Christian democracy. Maybe the dead also like something new. So that's uh, the I strength of tradition. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to something you were saying on the central positioning yeah. of, um, yeah. uh, of uh, Christian Democratic Party, uh, we tend to associate the right with uh, conservation and yeah. uh, at times reaction. Uh, the left with progress, and what, what about the center? What is the relationship between Christian democracy and progress? As I was saying, there are many debates in the last 50, 60 years, especially societal debates, on which conservatives were clearly, they were on the losing side and they were considered backward. Abortion, divorce in the 1960s and 70s, yeah. today the issue of same-sex 
uh, marriage. What is the relationship between Christian democracy and Christian politics on the one hand and progress? Well, I think for Christian Democrats, the first uh, element to protect or the first value to protect should be indeed every human being, human person with his or her own dignity. Uh, so that means that uh, theoretical models are less important than that keen interest for real human beings connected to others, that's true, but also with uh, uh, people with their own desires and wishes. So that should be taken seriously. So that means to me that the first thing that should be avoided by a Christian Democrat is alienation, which is quite an issue in our society. And some people really don't take care of that uh, well enough. For instance, today, uh, some prophets of the future say, well, uh, we should uh, live in containers in cities, uh, no longer in villages, etc. Well, that uh, kind of imposed lifestyle is, of course, going to alienate people from mm. the future society. On the other hand, there is no reason why we should not integrate certain new ideas on, for instance, environment in our thinking, but not in such a way that you become the slave of ideas. Like we had fundamentalist socialists in the past, uh, in the past today, we have a lot of fundamentalist green people, for instance, uh, the, 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 the heroes of sustainability as mm. a kind of elusive and ideological notion. in Brussels, which is the capital of Europe. And I think it is important uh, to address the relationship between Christian democracy and the nation state. Mm -hmm. It's a complex historical uh, relationship. I, I always say that the, the nation state was a double challenge for Christianity. On the one hand, it undermined the Christian notion of an international society of Christian peoples united by the religion in Europe, mm -hmm. because the nation now was the idol that replaced right. the Christian god. Uh, uh, so it was an international challenge, but it was also an internal challenge in the way in the new nation states dealt with um, education, social issues, welfare, that is in a centralizing way that tended to weaken the churches. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you see that and how does um, that explain the, the, the approach of Christian Democrats towards Europe? Yeah, it's a fascinating story because uh, there is also a cleavage there between Protestants and Catholics, for instance, and also the Orthodox are different. Huh? The Orthodox uh, are still in a position of symphonia, uh, the government and um, mm. the church is getting along well. The Protestants uh, recognized rather easily the supremacy of the state and they were functioning into it, whereas the Catholics were more reluctant to accept that new situation. And you can even say, for instance, okay, at the moment that the papal states huh, were, um, let's say, integrated in Italy and that the Pope lost his uh, uh, worldly power, at that very moment, the system of the societas perfecta was developed, uh, which means, or, or was uh, worked out more in detail. And that means societas perfecta, not that the church is perfect, but that it can operate independently. It doesn't need uh, other elements, states, etc. Uh, today, I think um, the relationships are uh, in a way much better, although today in the secularized Europe, many people are really opposed to religion and then thus also opposed to tradition in my eyes. But this being said, uh, today, I think the relationship is better. And the good thing of, for instance, the Catholic Church remains that it can also um, go beyond the borders of the nation state when it is necessary. So look, for instance, at what happened in the days of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. The Protestant churches were a little bit stuck within the structures of their states, whereas the Catholics yeah, were uh, supported by a global system with, uh, uh, well, with, with, with true politicians, Casaroli and others of the Vatican playing a part at that moment. So the fact that the church is still, um, the Catholic church then, is still going beyond, beyond those national states has also a value. So it's a bit, it's an ambiguous relationship, but an interesting one, of course. You emphasize uh, rightly the difference between Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to see how things have developed differently on the two sides of the Atlantic. This is always yeah. a striking yeah. uh, thing when, when one thinks about the public role of religion. Yeah. On the one hand, you have a very 
uh, widely recognized the role, public role of religion. The American yeah. presidents are still sworn in on the yeah. on the Bible. And on the other hand, on this side of the Atlantic, I have to say, both in Catholic and Protestant countries, less in Orthodox countries, as you said. I, I believe the Bible still feature, for yeah. example, in the Greece, uh, in the Greek, uh, Romania, uh, uh, Romania in the Orthodox, yeah. etc., the Orthodox world. Mm -hmm. Um, but how do you explain this cleavage, and uh, how is it relevant for contemporary politics? Well, uh, you can look at it um, at two different levels. Uh, uh, let's say a more historical, and also, to my eyes, a more, in my eyes, a more philosophical one. Historically speaking, it's obvious that in the United States, everybody was right away part of a minority. Huh? There are no religious majorities in the United States, exception made for the state of Utah with 70% of Mormons, but it's a small state. And then Rhode Island, I think, with more or less 50% of Catholics. And then elsewhere, everybody is a minority. Christians as such are not a minority, but the religious groups and the denominations are. So this means that um, there was no entanglement between state power and those religious groups. Um, and that, uh, well, the idea was freedom, liberty, also free competition. And that means that uh, religions had also to be lively in order to survive. They had uh, to be um, very present uh, on the religious market. If not, they were, of course, deemed to disappear. Huh? So that's a difference, I think. Another element that, in my eyes, but, uh, well, I can't prove it scientifically, but why not suggest the idea, I think that Americans are today more religious than many Europeans because they are also more optimistic and more creative. Uh, I think that, to some extent, one could see a parallel between the um, weakening force of society as a whole and the loss of faith. I think when you are very lively as a society, then there is a lot of hope, a lot of dreams are also present, and that leads probably to more religious interest than uh, when, when you fear, when you're feeling losing things, and then probably you stick to signs and you're saying, okay, there is nothing else than that. You lose illusions. So a merely scientific approach of society is, in my eyes, a sign of decay. Many people will disagree with me and will be very angry when they hear such a thing, but I think there is some, some, some uh, connection between those two elements. <laughs> What you are saying in many ways run counter 200 years of mainstream on the topic because you say vibrant societies tend to be more religious, vibrant, active, modernizing societies tend to be more religious yeah. while the the normal, the mainstream view has been from Voltaire uh, onwards that uh, yeah. the opposite was true. Um, and here I would like to ask you a question. Do you do you agree with the view which we heard based on this modernization theories, the idea that modernity and religion are incompatible and that modernity will kill religion when it's spread throughout the globe? Um, do you, would you say that religion as a force in politics and society is on the wane in, around the globe? Or is this uh, a, a very Eurocentric um, view on, on the matter? Well, it's certainly uh, too Eurocentric. If you just uh, erase religion and if you declare it irrelevant for politics, you're unable then to enter into a dialogue with 80% of the population on Earth. Huh? Because for most people, though in different degrees, religion does play a part. If you say then, okay, we are rational people, uh, we, we are not open to that, okay, then you are also not open to a certain dialogue with, with, with many, many people. Um, I think, Personally, that why is religion important and why do I think it makes the world larger? Because it um, shows that, well, science is not the only explanation of everything. Science is successful and we need it. Huh? It's very important to develop it further, but it is based on um, also a restriction of certain things. Huh? In order to build, uh, elaborate, uh, a scientific system, uh, you need to reduce certain elements. Uh, water, for instance, to its chemical formula, not to its uh, symbolic value that it can have in certain religions, etc. Now, now, if you are open for religion, you are also more open for um, hidden dreams, uh, for symbolic language, for a human being, as a human being, normally speaking, is not just a kind of uh, mix of scientific uh, knowledge, 
uh, and, and, and different knowledges, but also a person uh, yeah, open for many strange things, including love, aesthetical beauty, etc. Uh, and in that sense, I see a similarity between faith and humor. And uh, that's very often forgotten in my eyes. Uh, faith makes your world larger. And the same is true for the sense of humor. Both religion and humor can enlarge uh, our view of the world and can facilitate discussions because we, we see what is relative and what is absolute better than in another setting. Let's narrow down our focus again mm -hmm. on uh, uh, Europe mm -hmm. and the prospects of Christian democracy yeah. in Europe, not only in Christian politics, I would say. So how does, does Christian politics and Christian democracy have a future in societies which are largely post-Christian? That's the first development that one could mm -hmm. think um, points in the direction of progressive um, disappearance. But also the second aspect is the conviction politics, which is mm -hmm. typically Christian democratic politics, Christian Democrats have traditionally been conviction politicians, is also on the way. We're yeah. moving into an age uh, of marketing politics, of yeah. PR politics, with which I guess many Christian Democrats feel uncomfortable. Huh? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the first element, uh, here we have a, a kind of very uh, peculiar situation. Eh? On the one hand, indeed, it's true that in many countries Christianity is losing ground and is absolutely not as important any longer as it, as it used to be several decades ago. That's true. On the other hand, people are in search of an identity and sometimes they call themselves Christian even without uh, knowing what it truly means with an absolute lack of knowledge of their own tradition. Some are Christians, for instance, because they don't want to be Muslims. Not a very good reason, because that was not the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. Uh, besides, there were no Muslims in his days. Huh? <laughs> uh, but, um, well, so, so, so that means that uh, people are in search of something that is part of their identity and that is specific. Mm. And that's also typical for a global society. Uh, you want to be part of it, but you want to be eaten by it. You also need some, something specific that others don't have. That's also the reason why many Muslims are very much Muslims, because they absolutely want uh, to, to, to affirm, confirm their identity in that way. Now, in that regard, uh, I think a better knowledge of Christianity could help people to become real Christians, maybe. Why not? With some values which are a little bit disappearing in our world, like uh, forgiveness, uh, mercy, and those elements, they were typical Christians, they are also a bit against uh, fully logical thinking. There is no reason to be very merciful if you can also take revenge. There is also no reason uh, to forgive people if you can also just uh, use retaliation. And so here, I think it could be very important to, to, to um, foster again those notions um, and uh, create more space in sometimes systems of revenge and, and continuous struggle. So um, I'm not that uh, pessimistic. Those Christian values can play a part also in the future. Faith is another story. You can't impose faith. You can't do that. You can't decide to become a believer. That's a matter of uh, grace or other elements. But this being said, you can create an atmosphere in which openness to depth to deeper ideas uh, is not considered as a loss of time. Your basic advice, if I understand you correctly, to the Christian Democratic Party is to move from faith to culture and tradition, in a way. Yeah, that but is. without uh, yeah, moving from faith to culture and tradition, culture and tradition is the first step. But why excluding faith? So sometimes I, I see here, for instance, in Belgium, I, I know the Christian Democrat, uh, polit the Christian Democrats well here, and some of them still have faith. Uh, but for mo most of them, they are part of, of, of yet yeah, our society as it is today, uh, highly secularized. But at the same time, I see that people feel happy when Christian Democrats um, have the courage to call themselves Christians as well. Huh? So uh, not all of them are. Uh, but sometimes that's one of the criticisms we hear sometimes here. Christian Democrats, they are very open to Muslims, but they forget the Christians. Well, I think you can do both. Talking about the death 
of mm. Christian democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's it's dead, perhaps, but it tends to resurrect in um, in unexpected quarters, yeah. I would say. And one of the things that um, struck me lately is that you see some traditional Christian democratic com concepts appearing in the language and in the rhetoric of non-Christian democratic political forces, for example, although they subtly change their mm -hmm. meaning because the Christian outlook that originally animated them has disappeared. What do I mean in practice? Um, I have heard, for example, many Greens uh, use the concept of stewardship, which is a traditional Christian democratic um, notion, in, especially in, with regard to the relationship with the environment, or um, in all these debates about the fourth industrial revolution and the need to move to a less state-centered welfare system. Many socialists are uh, res resorting somehow to subsidiarity, to try to re-empower civil society in the provision of some welfare functions. So these concepts seem to have lost their original Christian imprint but they, they exist and they resurrect in a, in a rather Christian way in, uh, in the life of other political families. What do you think about that? It's absolutely true. So indeed, green uh, parties are very often Christian Democrats without a sense of humor. And they take also uh, <laughs> the, their ideas too seriously sometimes. Stewardship is one of the elements of the old Christian Democrat program, but without making it to a kind of absolute value. Typical for Christian Democrats has always been that you have to make a clear assessment that your personal conscience plays a part, that Thomas Aquinas, it's a long tradition. And those elements are sometimes a little bit missed in those who are very absolute in their ideas of stewardship. For instance, the world um, without human beings is also a, a solution, but it's also not the world anymore as we know it. So there should be a, a dialogue between the world and, 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 and the people living in it. Uh, the same is true for subsidiarity. There I think it's a very important notion. Um, it is also a notion, of course, in avoiding alienation, which for me is the key element of Christian democracy, democracy of, the, of the future. But I think here you could say, OK, um, subsidiarity uh, is important, but it means also that the decision has to be taken, if you understand the notion well, at the right level, not always at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, so you could say subsidiarity, in my eyes, doesn't mean that, for instance, referenda are becoming the cornerstone of the system, or that uh, 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 people, citizens, uh, uh, as a result of a lottery, for instance, become more or less in charge. That's not what subsidiarity is. Uh, it means, of course, that people should feel familiar with the structures they are living in, that's obvious. But on the other hand, sometimes you need a larger platform. Huh? Um, and, and that's sometimes forgotten, for instance, if you have to decide on, let's say, a refugee center in your garden, uh, then uh, people will say no. If it's far away in, uh, in, in a city at 100 kilometers, then they may say yes. So here you should also take into account the weakness of the human mind to find the right level of decision making. This is a good transition to my last question, the, mm -hmm. this idea of subsidiarity, which is about Christian democracy and the future of Europe debate. Mm -hmm. You know that we are having a pretty intense debate in this city and throughout the continent on the future structure of the European Union. And of course, a Christian democratic notion such as subsidiarity features prominently in it. But what I find interesting is that notions of Christian identity are also being played differently by, by different actors. For mm -hmm. example, uh, on the notion of immigration, the West, the Western Christian Democrats tend to stress the duty of solidarity and therefore the need to open borders. Uh, for example, the Central European countries tend to stress the notion of a Christian identity that has to be preserved from external encroachment. Um, what is the contribution that Christian democratic values and Christian democracy can give to the future of Euro debate? Well, I would say solidarity is also part of Christian identity, but solidarity is not limitless because human beings have to be the actors of that solidarity. So um, the idea of totally open borders is something that for citizens is impossible to live with. Uh, the idea of closing all borders 
is also closing the mind. So here we have, uh, we need a kind of uh, middle position again. Third way, uh, once more. Yeah, but in a good way, which means, uh, first of all, refugees in the technical sense, you have to accept them. You can't say, um, in difficult times, we are going to change the rules. And then you can see what are the degrees of generosity we can live with. And that's, I think, an interesting point. Solidarity is something that exists in the eyes of all people. First of all, they have a, a large degree of solidarity with themselves. So when they are uh, brushing their teeth in the morning, they see a, a, a beautiful person, me. Well, anyway. But then <laughs> you have also the family, and you can go one step further, the street, the village, etc., the country. But the further you go, the weaker solidarity becomes. Uh, can you blame people for that? No, because they are humans. You never should abandon all solidarity, but it can be in concentric circles. And if you maintain human rights as a starting point, beautiful. What I hope for Europe and Christian democracy is that Europe, uh, first of all, survives, uh, survives as an entity. The opposite would be absolutely stupid, and Europeans are much closer to each other than they sometimes think. But then secondly, that we can live in a system which is not fully capitalistic, that will be a tough thing, which at the same time reinterprets the welfare state, may be slightly more active than it used to be 40, 50 years ago. What's truly essential for it? A few elements in my eyes, for instance, the right to live. It would be a disaster to make, uh, well, to invite people to die because of financial reasons. That's for me, civilization. Other elements, of course, uh, well, there we should think what, uh, with regard to unemployment. We have to help people, obviously, but to what extent? Uh, how generous should we be there? That will be uh, pretty difficult. And just the idea of surviving in a global system which will be less generous with a generous system, which remains at the same time realistic, that's, for me, the ultimate um, challenge for Europe. And who else than Christian Democrats can play a large part in it if they have the courage to remain true Christian Democrats? There is certainly no shortage of things to work on. So mm -hmm. we, we as Martin Center will try our best to imagine this Christian Democratic future for Europe somehow. So I would like to thank Rick Torfs for a very fascinating discussion. A lot of your views are very contrarian, but beautifully so, <laughs> refreshingly contrarian, if I may say. We probably use the word third way too often because in the 1950s it was associated with Christian democracy. Since the 1990s it is Tony rather Blair. associated with <laughs> Tony Blair. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure the, the listeners will not, will not mind. Thank you very much for, uh, for the chat and thank you all for your interest. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That was today's episode of Europe Out Loud. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.